On Larry King Now, I'm joined by heavy metal royalty. It's Slipknot and Stone Sour frontman Corey Taylor. How competitive are the two bands? Quiet, quiet. You so know. So how do you deal with that? It's weird, you know. It's it's uh, sometimes I, I feel like I've, I've I've got two mistresses, you know. Is this true? You initially planned on lighting bins of camel feces on fire at yeah. Hot Fest. <laughs> I this is an obvious question. Why? Why? <laughs> There's no right way to answer that, to be honest. I just, you know, I woke up one day and I was just like, this ain't me. You know, I, you, you have this very specific vision of who you want to be. And sometimes chemicals and alcohol can kind of get, get you away from that. And I just realized that it's like, I'm not healthy. I'm not doing what I want to do. And my music is suffering for it. Plus, the buckle comes on like that. But the cool thing about this one is that there's a mask underneath the mask, just like that. Uh-huh. So. That is considerably scary. <laughs> All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our special guest, Corey Taylor, the Grammy Award winning and multi platinum selling frontman for two of the world's most prolific heavy metal bands, Slipknot and Stone Sour. Corey is also a New York Times best selling author and a budding filmmaker. Slipknot's newest album, Point Five The Gray Chapter, is available now, while their accompanying tour, Prepare for Hell, gets underway October 29th. And this weekend, Corey and Slipknot will kick off their tour with the infamous Knotfest. That's a music festival in San Bernardino, California. How can you head two bands at the same time? Uh, th th that's a really good question. I'm not really sure. You don't sleep a lot. Let's put it that way. How did that happen even? I don't well, think that's ever happened. Stone Sour was the band I was in originally before uh, Slipknot. So when I left Stone Sour to join Slipknot, um, I figured, you know, that would be it. You know, I, I would just do Slipknot full time and but then uh, right around the Iowa album, I just, you know, I just, I felt like I wasn't getting to do a, a certain, like more music, you know, cause it had gone really, really heavy. And I wanted to do a, a little more melodic stuff. So I had Stone Sour to kind of fall back on and it just became, it, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So I ended up doing two bands. So which is the more melodic? Stone Sour is more melodic. Um, it, it's more hard rock than heavy metal. It's got its heavy moments, but um, it, for the most part, it's the one where I get to, to make a, a, a sweeter sound, I guess, and then Slipknot's more of the, the dirtier sound. How did all this sound? Why did it start? And Slipknot started in 95, um, and uh, I wasn't even in the band at the time. I, I joined two years later. And it was kind of an amalgam of the, the best people in Des Moines. Um, we were, the, the people who made up Slipknot, we were the guys in the band who got stuff done. You know, we were the ones that kind of ran with it. We, we did a lot of the promotion. We came up with a lot of the ideas. We did a lot of the writing. And it just got to the point where we all kind of felt like we were carrying those bands. So being like-minded people, they all we all kind of started gravitating towards each other. And uh, when Slipknot formed, I was actually originally living in Denver because um, I'd gone out there to see what I could do musically. So I came back and there was this kind of super group going on in Des Moines and I knew everybody, you know, so we sat down and I was actually at the very first Slipknot show, front row, and something in my head, I just, and I'd never done this before, I was like, I'm gonna sing for this band someday. And then probably about a, a year later, they, they came and asked me to join. Some fans have said that Slipknot's new music is too similar to Stone Sour. Yeah, I they, you don't agree with that. I no, completely. And they based that off of hearing the single, uh, which came out called "The Devil and I," uh, and it's it's more melodic, but it's also it's definitely musically. You can tell that it's Slipknot. And I think one of the reasons they compared it to that because of my vocals, you know, because it's the one thing that kind of ties the two together. But now that a lot of people are streaming the new album, they're hearing everything and they're able to kind of compare and contrast. They realize that it's all Slipknot. How competitive are the two bands? Quiet, quiet, you know. So how do you deal with that? It's weird, you know. It's, it's uh, sometimes I, I feel like I've, I've, I've got two mistresses, you know. But at the same time, they're very understanding of the fact that when I'm doing one, the other is, is less of a priority. And then, you know, when I'm doing the other, I just kind of hop back and forth for the focus. 
Now, I'm told that Slipknot's newest album, Five, The Great Chapter, is its first in six years, the delay caused by the ultimate, the untimely passing of the longtime bassist, uh, Paul Gray. What did he die of? He died of uh, a mixture of uh, different, uh, like, prescription chemicals, yeah. I mean, he'd, he'd fought addiction for a very long time, and uh, unfortunately, it, yeah. Do you dedicate the album to him? Yeah, yeah. How did his death affect the group? It was very dark. It was very, very heavy. Um, the day we found out, we were all sitting in my house, and the only thing I can describe it is like this this dense numbness that kind of descended on us. And How old was he? He was, oh man, he, he wasn't even 40. Is, we associate heavy metal with drugs, is that fair? You know, I, it depends on the band, really, you know, because I, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of bands who, you know, they, they go very straight edge, which means they don't touch anything. So I, th I think it's easier for people to perceive hard rock and heavy metal as being very drug addled. But if you look these days, a lot more of the pop bands and the hip hop bands try to purport that kind of lifestyle. Is heavy metal, this asks as a man who's a Sinatra file, I know uh, Frank. And which we have that in common. Oh, by you the like Frank too? Oh, I love him, yeah. Now, Frank would say if we were sitting together watching heavy metal, he would say, can you hum this? Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is it music? I think it is, definitely. You know, because, I mean, it's like, it's like comparing free jazz to Sonny Rollins, you know? It's just, it's a different type, you know? Um, saying that Ornette Coleman couldn't make jazz the way he wanted to is not the same as saying that it's not jazz. So for me, uh, thrash metal, heavy metal, black metal, hard rock, it's all music, as long as you're feeling something. What's the difference between thrash metal and heavy metal? Uh, I think heavy metal's more melodic. Um, heavy metal is more of a general term as well. You know, it's kind of a blanketing term. You know, there's so many different subgenres and, and flavors that go under that. that is that Kiss heavy to, metal? I think they have moments of heavy metal, but I think they're more hard rock, to be honest. Uh, this album, what do you think? Uh, you think Paul would have liked it? I think he would have loved it. Yeah, yeah. We. Uh, I mean, it's, it's essentially the story of the last four years, um, dealing with the aftermath of his, his death and all of us trying to kind of get back to a place where we wanted to make music again. I understand you have new musicians on Slipknot's album and tour, but you're yet to deem them members of the group. Yeah. What does it take to become a member of the group? Uh, time, um, a show of passion, which, you know, they're getting there, but at the same time with this band, you earn everything. Do they feel um, less used, less? No, 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 we, we make them feel very much at home, but at the same time, you know, you don't just walk into a gig like this, you know, you have to earn your bones, basically, and uh, so far they're doing really well, and, and we've told them, you know, it's like there's no promises, but at the same time, we're really enjoying playing with you, so Are we'll see what happens. Are your concerts very long? Yeah, they get there, you know. I mean, we've done almost two hours at, uh, sometimes, which can be very hectic. Are they known musicians? Do people get well-known in this field? I think so, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, a lot of people talk about whether or not rock is dead or not, and it's like, you have to understand, I mean, there's a whole uh, following that people don't even realize uh, that that know us, know the bands that... But these new people, with. you keep their names secret, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that we, kind of gimmick? No, not really, because we wanted... Uh, People automatically are going to assume something when you put new music out and you're missing two people. So what we wanted to do was take the focus off of the new people and put it on the music. So, and I think in a way it kind of became something that people grasped onto that we wouldn't say anything, but I think it worked. You think we'll have a female rocker in Slipknot? Maybe, you never know. <laughs> We're gonna take a break. Next, what does Slipknot have in store for their upcoming Prepare for Hell tour? We'll talk about that when we come back. We're back with Corey Taylor with two bands, Slipknot and Stone Sour. Some call these both bands new metal. You call it heavy metal, right? Mm -hmm. Why is it so popular? Uh, I mean, well... You sell millions of albums, right? We do, Worldwide. Yeah, yeah which is... Which do you tour worldwide, too? Yeah, yeah. We, we've got fans all over the planet, which, you know, we're pretty grateful for. I think it... I, I think, honestly, it, it, it responds to a certain type and when you've got a, a good message that is kind of offsetting some of the other messages that heavy metal can kind of put out there 
I, I think it it, it 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 generates a fan base that is very very loyal. You push the envelope a lot, don't you? A little bit, yeah. A little you, bit. What's the biggest misconception about heavy metal thing? You ever regret anything you've done? No, no. Um, I, I regret some of the actions that I've had personally. What do you um, mean? Just you know, I mean, I'm I'm five years sober now, so uh, you know, there 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 are large parts of my life that I don't remember. And uh, and did you work? Yeah. While high? Yeah, yeah. And and some of that I regret. But everything else, you know, I mean, it, how'd you it's, get clean? Uh, I just I, you know I woke up one day and I was just like, this ain't me. You know, I you you have this very specific vision of who you want to be. And sometimes chemicals and alcohol can kind of get get you away from that. And I just realized that it's like I'm not healthy. I'm not doing what I want to do, and my music is suffering for it. And it, it was kind of that easy. You have family? Yeah, yeah. Children? Uh, yeah, I have three kids. Um, what do they think of your music? They love it. My son, who's 12, um, gets very, very put off when people come up to us like in a Target or something and want an autograph. He's just like, ugh, can we just go home, you know? So. What about your wife? My wife actually works in the business. She works in management, so that's, oh. and that's how we met. And uh, she, you know, she's probably my, my, my biggest supporter, my secret weapon. That's great. And yeah, she's awesome. I'm told, oh, is this true, you initially planned on lighting bins of camel feces on fire at yeah. Hot Fest? <laughs> I, this is an obvious question. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> There's no right way to answer that, to be honest. Um, it was an artistic thing that, uh, and that's one of the misconceptions about Slipknot. We, I mean, we have a lot of artistic co content that goes into this. So for us, and especially for Clown, my, my, uh, my partner in all this, he had a vision of what not fest should smell like, right? And uh, he came to me, he was like, we're gonna do, we're gonna do this. And I went, really? That, <laughs> right. He can go out there, so. No but, kidding. Uh, they, unfortunately, they put the kibosh on that. Good but, idea. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, <laughs> I understand that. Now, what band wears masks? Slip Slipknot does, yes. Stone Sour would never do that. Does not. No, oh, no, of course, no. there. Well, I've, I've dressed in drag once in Halloween, but that was <laughs> as close as it came. Uh, let's see, is this a mask you wear? Let's bring it in. Yeah, this is the new one, yeah. <laughs> Who designs these masks? I came up with Thank the concept. And, uh, and does the whole band wear different masks? Yeah, yeah, everybody has a different Put mask. it on. Oh. Do you have a name for this mask? No, just, it's, uh, it hasn't you gotten sing to the point with it? where it smells. But uh, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that you have to kind of do is you have to make sure that you can perform in it, or it, or if not, then it's like, what was the point of that? Are you, you know? performing Halloween? Oh yeah, in Dallas. So it goes on like this. The buckle comes on like that. But the cool thing about this one is that there's a mask underneath the mask, just like that. Uh huh. So that is considerably scary. <laughs> Do you plan to do other nutty things? Well... Like, the idea for Mask, came, did it come up with a horror song, a particular song you were singing? No, no, you know, I mean, honestly, and, and like I said before, I mean, you know, I joined Slipknot afterwards, but they were wearing masks already. And the reason that they started wearing the masks was because it allowed them and it's allowed us to kind of let that animal off the chain, basically. It allowed it. us to kind of be free on stage. How much of the act do you wear it? Oh, uh, the whole thing. Yeah. Wait a yeah, minute. we wear masks the entire show. Yeah. I know That's a lot of slip bands, knot, right? Yeah. A lot of bands they'll come out and they'll wear it for part of it and then they just they get rid of it, but we from the minute we hit the stage to the minute the 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 outro rolls, we're in the masks. Are they all different kinds of masks? Yeah. Yeah. And how do people then identify you? They Well, they know me from Stone Sour because I don't wear a mask in Stone Sour. Um but we have such dedicated fans that sometimes they get uh, they get a little like CIA on us, and they'll they'll sneak pictures of us when we're not looking, and they'll put them up on the internet. What artist influenced you when you were young? When I was young, I mean, every I mean, I've listened to everything, you know. Like I mean, we talked about Frank Sinatra. I love Sinatra, but my my grandmother had me listening to uh, Jim Reeves and Elvis Presley, and then I kind of discovered like punk rock, heavy metal through babysitters, my older cousins, you know, and then thrash metal on my own because I was in junior high by the time I found that. Uh -huh. After the break, 
We delve into Corey's relationship with the paranormal and learn more about his life outside of music. Stay with us. We're back with the amazing Corey Taylor. He's got two bands going, Slipknot and Stone Sour, both very successful world tours. New album out, lots of things going for him. I understand you love Broadway musicals. I do, yeah. You like Les Mis. Yeah, it's one of my favorite, well, it was one of my favorite books. And then uh, and I went and I got a chance to see it on, on Broadway, actually, and I was just like, oh, it's, it's a great fantastic. book. You see the movie was pretty good. I did, yeah. I mean, it was it was good. I I, I didn't like it as much as the uh, the, the original uh, uh, musical, but I, I thought it was pretty, pretty decent. You're a firm believer in the paranormal. Mm. How did that start? That started when I was really young. I mean, I, I started having uh, things happen to me when I was about 10. Like? You know? Just uh, my friend, uh, some friends of mine, we uh, snuck out of my house uh, and we, we went to this abandoned house that was like, that we would walk past every day on our way to school, right? In Des Moines. And, uh, yeah, this is in Des Moines, just off of Southeast 14th and like these, what we called the Southside Woods. And um, we were getting ready to walk around and kind of check everything out and this, thing came down the stairs, it was a two-story house, and we look up and this thing was coming down the stairs towards us, and you know, we basically thing. killed ourselves running. Yeah, it was like, it was, a, it was a human shape, but you could just tell that it wasn't a person, you know? It, it was almost like two-dimensional. You could kind of see through it, but you couldn't. So you began to study this sort of thing? Yeah, well, I mean, it just, it, not, not that early, but I mean, it continued to kind of happen to me where I would have different... Like, you uh, had an encounter in Hollywood, right? Yeah, yeah, at the at the the mansion on uh, Laurel Canyon where we recorded. Everybody calls it the Houdini Mansion, but he never actually lived there. So what happened there? Uh, several different things. Um, uh, basically, there would be this this crazy ballroom music that we would hear almost like like every other night at like two thirteen in the morning, and then you'd go to look for it and it'd go away. Um, I had uh, the the blankets yanked off of me in the night. Um, it just, I mean, I could go on, so. Okay, you, you were an atheist, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. How then do you explain this? Well, I, I talked about it in my book where I was, was trying to, uh, uh, if anything happened on the way to heaven, in a, a very long subtitle after Sold that. a lot. Yeah, it did okay, yeah. Um, to me, I, I kind of came up with a theory of how the will uh, the human will can emboss itself onto the soul, which I think is our what we call energy. And after the body fades, that energy can kind of carry on with that will still embossed onto that, which is why when you see it, when you see spirits and whatnot, and you see that they have clothes on, it's what you call that, that uh, the, the mind's eye kind of concept of what we looked like, what like in dreams and stuff. What so, happens when you die? I think the energy just kind of carries on and it, it just kind of comes back, you know? I, I think, think you it, have awareness? I think so, But yeah, you absolutely. don't believe in the God. No, I mean, it's, and, 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 and I, I, do, I try not to, you know, like judge people who do. Um, I try to judge I, people the out their way. actions, absolutely, so. Has it, has all this paranormal thing affected your performances? No, not really. I mean, because I, I try to be a very practical person, which was one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I was like, how can I be like this? And yet I've had all these things happen to me, you know? So it was basically me trying to figure out what was going on. You also wrote a book called Seven Deadly Sins. I did, yeah. Setting, it's setting the argument between born bad and damaged good, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you view sin as a good thing? Um, I think that the, the quote unquote deadly sins can be taken both ways, you know. Um, in in moderation, like lust can be a wonderful thing. Absolutely, you know. Um, and and one of the things that I tried to do was to put forth seven deadlier sins, which are basically all crimes, you know. Which which would be like you know, child abuse, murder, rape, things like that. Like those are sins, you know. The seven deadly sins to me are part of being a human. Do you relate this to your kids? Yeah, very much so. I mean, which and it's hard to put that in perspective when, you, when you're trying to be a parent, you know, they're like, well, you just wrote a whole book about this. What does like, your wife think? My wife, you know, like I said, she's very supportive and, uh, you know, she read it and, you know, I, I kind of come clean on a bunch of stuff in that book and she was just like, ugh. Come clean like? Well, just, you know, the, each, each uh, sin had a chapter. So obviously there was the lust chapter and she was like, oh, really? And then obviously all this stuff had happened before we met, but she was just like, you're gross. 
you know, and not not to get too in depth, but I told her I was like, yeah, but you know, I had to go through that to kind of be who I am now, and that's one of the reasons why I think that lust isn't a sin, gluttony isn't a sin. You kind of have to go through those things to figure out who you are. How has success affected you? Um, when I was younger, it, it affected me. I, like I didn't know really how to take it, you know, because. You kind of get it on both sides. You have people who endear yourself, endear themselves to you because of who you are, and then they endear themselves to you because of what you can provide for them. So it, early on, you kind of have to figure out how to separate the two. Uh, to me, it's it's uh, success has definitely made me, uh, you know, uh, appreciate what I have. Um, we've been able to do this for 15 years professionally, and uh, I'm very grateful for what we have. Would you like your kids to get into music? You know, they're all very gifted. Um, I, you know, to me, I want to kind of leave it up to them. My son is a, is a really good singer. He's a hell of a singer, and he's got a better ear for it than I did at that age. You have two daughters. Yeah, yeah, older and younger. You want to be a filmmaker? Yeah, yeah. Like I, what, I you love movies. Direct? No, um, just just because there's so much that goes into that. I, I would rather write scripts or produce. Just to kind of start at, you know, either be at the bottom or help get it get it to where it needs to be, you know. So, and right now I'm, I'm actually I'm producing a movie that uh, hopefully we'll start shooting next year. On paranormal? No, no. It's it's more of a supernatural kind of thing where it's 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 uh, without giving too much away. It kind of deals with purgatory, which I, I I also think is very interesting. You're an interesting guy, Corey. I do okay. It's when we come back, Corey takes your questions. We'll play a little game of if you only knew. Don't go away. <laughs> We're back with Corey Taylor, who's got it all made. I'm told that Stone Sour, your other band, will be releasing a new album in 2015. Yeah, yeah, we're doing it. We're putting together a covers album, um, just uh, just a bunch of songs that we just love to play, you know. That um, other people wrote. And yeah, sang. yeah, yeah. You know, all I mean, in the realm of hard. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Everybody from uh, Judas Priest to Bad Brains to you know. What was your biggest of, hit? With with uh, Stone Sour would be Through Glass. And what about with Slipknot? With Slipknot, probably Duality. Okay, we have some social media questions. Okay. Gold Ace of Spades on Twitter. As a veteran in the rock and roll and heavy metal world, what impact do you want this new Slipknot album to achieve? Um, I want it to show that our genre is still very much alive. Um, you know, obviously, Gene Simmons was very, uh, very famously quoted as saying rock and roll was dead. I think he's got a point, but at the same time, you kind of have to use the new technology to your advantage. And I think we're gonna show people that you can still use the technology and still have something in rock and roll. At Pumpkin Weenie on Twitter, do you draw any influence from the Smashing Pumpkins? No, not really. I mean, I, I like that band, but uh, you know, they, they, I didn't get into them until way later, so. At Waste of the Demon on Twitter, which song on the new album feels most personal to you? Oh, that's a toss-up um, between Skeptic, which is very much about Paul, and Goodbye, which is a song I wrote um, based around the day that he died. At Easy Peasy Pumpkin via Twitter, what are the differences of having two new members, both artistically and in terms of camaraderie? Um, I think the biggest difference is that you kind of have to, when you're writing and you're recording, you kind of have to develop a relationship very quickly so you can communicate and you can kind of get to the point and be able to create the music. Kirk Allen M on Facebook, what drives you most to continue on with Slipknot? Um, the music, definitely the music. Uh, if I didn't enjoy the music, I wouldn't do it. Roby NYC on Instagram, do you think Slipknot's image is good for young kids? Uh, it depends on if you, it, it depends on how you take it. Um, for us, we've always tried to put the art first and the message being very positive. Um, but if you if you don't see that, then I could see how it could be taken negative. You ever have a conflict where both plans, uh, both groups are going to tour at the same time? We've done shows together, not the same day, but you know we've done uh, we did Rock and Rio a couple of years ago. So you go back and forth? Yeah, yeah. I just I did one one day and the next it, was, it it kicked the crap out of me, but I did it. And Keen McClellan on Instagram. I'm a musician myself. I want to know what type of studios you use, and if you go into the studio with the songs written, or do you write them there? Uh, we do both, to be honest. Um, you know, for us, we, we tend to use technology as a tool, not as a way to 
to kind of make things easier or quicker. So it doesn't really matter what studio we use as long as we can kind of get the sounds that we're looking for. We play a little game of If You Only Knew. I okay. Just throw, remember the first girl you kissed? Oh, yeah. Jennifer Barnes, seventh grade, Moines. Waterloo, Iowa, actually. I was living Waterloo, in Waterloo, Iowa. Iowa. Yeah, my mom lives there, so. If you yeah. ever find out what happened to her. <laughs> I'd almost be terrified, too. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest splurge. Biggest splurge, uh, the first time I got a, a pretty decent paycheck, and this is true, I spent I spent ten thousand dollars at Best Buy. I went and I bought I bought I'm a movie freak, so I bought a ton of DVDs and like a really good DVD player. And then I was like, okay, I got that out of my system. I'm fine now. It might have been the best day anyone ever had. They couldn't even give me a real receipt. They had to give me a computer printout. It was ridiculous. Artists would be surprised to find on your iPod. You know, I, mean, I, I don't believe in guilty pleasures. I think if you like what you like, then you shouldn't feel guilty about it. But I've got everything from Les Mis on there to Green Day, Slayer. Uh, I got a ton of jazz. I, we talked about Sonny Rollins. I've got a bunch of Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk. I, I like what I like. Favorite city to perform in? Oof. Oh, it, it, it's, that's tough because there's so many great cities. Never forget what city you're in. Uh, I forgot what country I was in once. That was interesting. What country was it? It was uh, it was the Czech Republic, and but I accidentally called it Hungary on stage, <laughs> and uh, yeah, the guys have never let me live that. <laughs> first tattoo you ever got? Uh, I got the the initials of one of my first serious girlfriends, and luckily I had it covered over because as soon as I got that, she broke up with me. Any plans for a new tattoo? Yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of great ideas, um, and, and the thing is, I, I, I uh, as, as serious as I take my tattoos, I, I also have like a bunch of goofy ones as well. So I want to get a tattoo of uh, Boba Fett dressed as Evil Knievel because I saw it on a bootleg T-shirt once. I think it'll be cool. If it, I knew Evil pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I bet. If, if a deceased person could visit you in ghost form, who would you want it to be? Oh, uh, definitely Paul. Paul or my uh, my uh, my father-in-law, who I lost a couple of years ago. Something people would be surprised to learn about you. I love cooking. I had, I got into I got into cooking after all my, kinds. Yeah, yeah, and I've, I've I've gotten pretty good at it too. But my problem is I can only cook for two or two hundred. I don't know. I have no moderation. <laughs> yeah. Favorite superhero? Spider-Man. Something you couldn't live without? Coffee. Coffee. Oh yeah. What scares you the most? Sharks. Proudest accomplishment? Uh, the fact that my kids are pretty good people. That's my, that's my greatest accomplishment. Best advice you ever got? Uh, take care of your money and take care of your family. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Corey Taylor, big thanks to my guest. Great having him with us. Be sure to buy Slipknot's newest album, Point Five, The Great Chapter. It's available now. And don't forget to buy tickets to Slipknot's Prepare for Hell Tour starting next week. And always you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. And I'll see you next time.